Welcome to our session on financial reporting. My name is Francis Brigands, of course. Uh, we, we've had a little bit of a break, you and me, from this course. And I'm hoping, obviously, that in this, uh, these few days that you've had off, you've managed to catch up with some of the homework. Now, it's great to do homework, of course, but um, I know one person asked me, uh, was it earlier today, yesterday, I can't remember, earlier today, uh, how do you do the provision for unrealized profit? How do you do the pups? And my response was, I don't mind explaining, and of course here it is, here's the explanation, but don't forget the exam is on the 6th of September, not December, so you really have to do something to catch up, do it much faster. Even though I hate talking like that to students, I have to be honest and say, um, the main reason why people are failing these exams that are held every three months is they don't realize the shortage of time and they're not pushing themselves enough. So if you're asking me something about what we did on the second session, um, that's um, a bit of a worry for me. So can I just quickly make a comment like that? don't want to offend anyone, but the exam is now very close. And if you are committed to doing the exams every three months, you must forget about everything else and concentrate on one subject or you'll never get there. Okay, so uh, just I had to just make that comment to keep you aware of where we are. Now, in times gone by, we have done pups, for example, under Sam and Play and S Script, as I'll show you here. This is our program. If I take you there, this is our program. Um, my email address there, please ask if I can help in any way. Uh, I've ticked off all the questions we've done in class. Obviously, you've done lots of homework, of course, judging from many other uh, people who've been sending me questions. Uh, people are working steadily through the homework. Um, so pull and shut, we've done all that a long, long time ago. We then did lots on published accounts and on standards and leasing the contracts, the new style of doing contracts, five-step approach. We've done mallet, chamber, all these kinds of things as we finished off last time. So what I need to do today is to pick up a little bit um, on uh, tax, do a little bit more on tax because that is coming up. And once I've got that done, I'll carry on with things like foreign currency trans transactions because the reason why I say this is such a big syllabus um, in the last few months, with effect from September, we've seen the biggest expansion in F7 for 15 years. I've been teaching this for 25 years, and to me, I'm really shocked to see what a big expansion to the syllabus has just happened with effect from September. And I would say, don't leave it, because in December there may be further expansion. Next March there'll be another uh, expansion. So there are lots of uh, new standards coming in through the pipe. Uh, in the pipeline coming in. So things like leasing, they're changing all that in due course. So I would say the sooner you do it, the, the, the smaller the syllabus will be. So once I've done my foreign currency transactions, it takes me about half an hour to do that. Uh, I've written a special supplementary pack, which of course you have access to. We've begun to use that anyway. And then once I've got that done, there are a couple of small things like Llama and Eden. In between, there's a slightly bigger one called Altered. This is where we revisit published accounts. Remember how we did it? We looked at the question called Interceptor a long time ago, page 100, where I showed you the oral technique. Open up required accounts, read the question, make adjustments line by line, solve the technique for published. And then we did lots and lots of standards, as we are doing standards today. And then we're revisiting published. Okay. And uh, that's why we need to do questions like Lama and Altered, etc. Eden, of course, is going back to some more published, uh, some more standards. But the astonishing statistic, I, in doing the few days uh, that I haven't been doing this course, I've been preparing for revision and all that kind of thing and doing other courses. Um, I was analyzing the specimen paper to the new syllabus, and I'm alarmed to see that something around 61%, somewhere around 61%, of the specimen paper to the September exam that ACC have published, available on the website, 61% is on published and standards. I thought it was about 50, 54, but when I recounted every single mark, looking at the marking guide, etc., 
it's 61%. So let's say roughly, you know, 60% will be the norm in the exam. It could be 55, but it'd be way above half the paper. So that's why we're spending more than half our time, well over half our time, uh, doing published and standards, including the whole of this session. Okay, so most welcome to our Wednesday, the 27th of September. Right, where should we go with all this? The class notes. When I saw you last time, we looked at the question called Chamber on page 196. So today I propose to carry on with that and take it a little bit further. So that's what we did last time. Page 196, a question called Chamber, past exam question. Remember the cud mnemonic and that kind of thing. Today what I need to do is to set up some crucial homework practice, a question called Atlas from a few exams ago. Uh, someone asked me the other day, these, ex these questions you have in your uh, class notes, are they past exam questions? Uh, there was a time when every question I put down, I referred to it as you know June 2013 or December 2010 or whatever it was, and I found that it was distracting for students because um, you know, there are too many references, too much information. But let me say 85% of these examples I've used, apart from the very, very, very early basic ones, 85%, 85 out of 100 examples that I've used are all past exam questions. So I didn't want to burden you with, say, with this uh, atlas came from this particular. They're all past exam questions as good as 85% of them. Okay, so if you do these questions, you should be well prepared. All right, so that's a lovely example, answer given on page 444. Uh, so what is deferred tax? You may be asked this, you see, what is deferred tax? What are we talking about? <clears throat> Remember, when you're doing your tax for published accounts purposes, you have C, U, D. C, obviously, is the current year tax. The U is the under over, over provision for last year. And of course, the D is the deferred tax because of things like capital allowances and depreciation. As I have shown you uh, when we did our question called Interceptor a few, a few uh, lectures ago. So I'd like you to fill in with me some little points here. What is deferred tax? Quite an easy little thing I'm going to give you. DT, deferred tax, is CT on TD. Easy to remember. DT is CT on TD, i.e., if you'll fill it in with me, please, extra corporation tax, in some countries called income tax, extra corporation tax, comma, at the latest enacted rate, regarding the future on temporary differences. Okay, so the TD stands for temporary differences. So what are temporary differences? A natural next question. And for that I've got to say Temporary differences, this is easy. So fill it in with me, please. Temporary differences are differences that are temporary. Truly, totally this was easy. Now, what do I mean by that? Uh, the other day I was saying to you when we buy, a, a, let's say, a machine, and it costs, say, $1,000, and it has a four-year life, depreciation per annum will be 250 per uh, charge to the P&L every year. Okay, assuming there's no scrap value. But the tax people give you capital allowances at a different rate to the company claiming depreciation. So in the first year, you might well get a capital allowance of 400. So out of the 1,000, the 400 is used up in the first year. What remains 600? Maybe 25% of that is available in the second year. So it's a kind of a reducing balance basis. So what we're saying is because lots and lots of capital allowances are claimed in the first year, 
the company pays less tax in the first year. But in later years, the company will pay more tax because in those years, the depreciation added back when you're doing your tax computation will be more than the capital allowances being deducted. Okay, so if you have more depreciation added back than capital allowances being deducted, as we saw in that interceptor question, it'll cause more tax. And deferred tax provides for all that tax now. Okay, temporary differences are differences that are temporary. <laughs> Comma. Caused by differences in the timing, that's why they're sometimes called timing differences, of when items are treated in the PNL and when they are assessed to tax in tax computations. And the best example I can think of here is this thing called accelerated capital allowances. Accelerated capital allowances. In other words, capital allowances are given at a faster, more accelerated rate than depreciation is claimed. Okay, so can I just ask you to revise the interceptor question? Page 100, which you spent a lot of time on. All right, so there you are. That's a little look at the general story there. <coughs> the key concept of deferred tax, this is my way of, my way of summarizing deferred tax in 10 minutes. So let's see if I can get this message across. Uh, you must understand this because deferred tax is traditionally done extremely badly. So there are two levels really at which the examiner comes in on deferred tax. One is to say to you, look, this is your published accounts exercise and you've got to fill in the tax figure. And so the student goes away and says, right, there are three elements, C, U, D. What I'm saying is the D is done very badly. So what we've got to do now is open up as a second issue, what is this deferred tax? I know at one level it is opening deferred tax compared to closing deferred tax, the difference goes to the P&L, the D of cut. I appreciate that. But what I'm saying here is I'm putting, taking the D to one side and putting it under the microscope. So my class notes here need to be studied and those little homework questions done. But this is a start on explaining a little bit more on deferred tax, as I promised you when I saw you last time. So where are we? <clears throat> the, um, the one on the left, let's say, is accounting profits. So you can fill in these boxes with me, please. Accounting profit. And oppose, I suppose opposed to that is something else called taxable profit. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> now, the accounting profit is based on generally accepted accounting principles, i.e. the IASs, IFRSs, etc. <coughs> <coughs> and so this is your PL profit. The taxable profit on the right is based on fiscal rules. That's a tax law in each country. And so this is your tax computation. So let's say the accounting profit is say, <coughs> what shall we say, 250,000. And the taxable profit is say 150,000. That difference, 
which I'll show in, in here somewhere. is described as differences say a hundred thousand 250 on the right I'm sorry 250 on the left 150 on the right say difference of a hundred thousand some of the some of those are known as permanent differences and some of these are known as temporary differences Now the permanent differences, examples I can think of that the examiner has mentioned in his writings over the years, answers, etc. Entertaining, disallowed. As you know, suppliers, customers, entertaining is disallowed. So it's not that it's disallowed this year and be allowed next year, it's disallowed forever. And the other one is things like dividend income which is, of course, exempt from corporation tax. I suppose the company paying it has already suffered corporation tax, so the company receiving it, that's you, you will not have to pay tax again. So the upshot of all that is your permanent differences, you do not provide for deferred tax on these things. So do not provide for deferred tax on permanent differences. Okay, when it comes to temporary differences on the right, so let's just go back and have a little look. The one on the left, higher up the page, the accounting profit is say 250,000. And the one on the right, taxable profit for whatever reason is 150,000. So the difference between the two is 100,000. Some of those differences say permanent differences. Some of those differences say 20,000 are permanent differences. So the leftover 80,000 is temporary differences. And deferred tax, as you know, is only provided on dif temporary differences. Examples. Accelerated capital allowances. And another famous one that the examiner is very fond of these days is where you have revaluation surpluses. Nasty point there. <clears throat> revaluation surpluses. Um, what, what do I mean by that? Say you've got uh, at the end of the year a building uh, worth, I don't know, what shall we say, 50,000 and it's revalued to say 60,000. So the difference between the two is say 10,000. If you want to put a few more zeros in to make it millions, to make it more significant, that's fine. But let's say you've got a building worth 50,000 and you're revaluing it to 60,000. The revaluation surplus is 10,000. What we're saying is, if you were to sell that building in, in the next year, the 10,000 represents some kind of a chargeable gain to tax. And so what deferred tax does is prudently provide, provides for that um, extra 10,000 at the latest corporation tax rate. Okay, so if that's 20% or 17% or whatever, you must provide for that. Now, the examiner is very, very fond of that point. It came up again in the specimen paper. Okay, so um, just be careful of that. It's a point that students are very weak on and the examiner has detected a weak spot. And so he keeps examining that regularly. So revaluation surplus. I might actually spend a few extra minutes on that in a minute. Um, I'll just say, even if no intention to sell. Okay, sometimes if there is a revaluation surplus, deferred tax may be needed. If assets sold realizing a gain, tax must be provided for. So some of the differences between opening and closing deferred tax goes to um, revaluation surplus. Now what I'm going to do is leave you to read up these next few pages of class notes, discussion, etc. It's not that likely to come up in the exam as a big essay these days, but the principles from those notes will be 
in these multiple choice questions. Remember, 60% of our exam is on multiple choice uh, type questions. So those principles can be converted into a little MCQ, is it A, B, C, and, or D? And you've got to pick up D because that's the principle on page 200 or whatever of my class notes. So that's what you must do, okay? I'll leave you to look that up. It's all very easy to follow. And there's a question called Becky, pretty useful question. Uh, beyond that, I've given you an answer to Becky. But if you move on to say page 208, I'll show you how this thing works. So page 208. <clears throat> now, be careful. Frequently examined recently. Re recent sittings. So let's have a little read together. The directors have estimated the provision for income tax for 2014, whenever this question came up, at 38 million. So this is your C of CUD, you see. At, the, at that date, there were 74 million of taxable temporary differences, of which 20 million related to a revaluation of leasehold property. I see. Is that a roundabout way of saying this 74 has got two branches to it, 20 and 54? Okay, so the 20 refers to these, to the revaluation surplus, that building I was telling you about, whereas the 54 is all the other bits and pieces like accelerated capital allowances, etc. There are lots of things that can happen there. The income tax rate is 20% and the opening balance and the trial balance of deferred tax brought forward from the end of the previous year, so it's the opening for this year, is 12 million. So how do we put this together? You have the C. In this particular case, there's no under over provision. Over usually is a credit, is a credit in the trial balance, whereas under is a debit in the trial balance. So that might be your only way of telling whether it's an under or over. In this case, of course, there's nothing. But that was last time's lecture two times ago. Deferred tax transfer, how do we get that? Now, this is very, very tricky stuff. You have to be careful with this. Uh, the balance sheet at the end of the year is given as the opening 12,000. Where do I get that from? It's back here, you see, this 12 million. So in thousands, these are all thousands, 12,000 is in, uh, 12 million is 12,000. So that's the first thing we do. The next thing you do is you bring in your 74,000 and that's 14,800. Now, traditionally what we would do is the difference between the 12 and the 14.8, we simply put into the PL. You can't do that anymore, not in this particular context, because what's happening here is the amount that ends up in the PL is subject to first transferring something to the revaluation reserve. So what we're saying is there's a revaluation reserve, a revaluation surplus on the leasehold property, and if the leasehold property is sold, you must find tax on that surplus, which happens to be 20,000, 20% 20 tax is, is 4,000. So the way to do it is you do your Get your 12,000 in place, do that first, do the second, and this is the balancing figure. But don't just blindly transfer that to the PL. You've got to first allow for the revaluation. So, what you do is something like this you debit your revaluation reserve, 4,000, and of course, you credit your deferred tax, 4,000, which is, of course, this thing. Okay. And whatever's left after that, the 4,000 compared to the 2,800 shows up the 1,200, which is then transferred into here. You see, so what makes it a bit awkward is the 2,800 is so small that if you've got 4,000 being transferred to the revaluation reserve, yes, uh, credit deferred tax debit revaluation reserve, the 4,000 being bigger than the 2,800 
when you actually do your transfer to the PL, it's a 1200 in brackets. Okay, that's pretty tricky stuff. That's about the worst you can get. And unfortunately, very often you do get that. All right, so even though that was part of the homework, I thought it was well worth just spending a bit of time on that. And if you want to test yourself, there's uh, even more on page 451. Okay, so there you are, a little bit on tax and deferred tax. Where are we? Let's see if we can move on a bit. Uh, before I come to my published accounts advanced, uh, can I ask you to just interject somewhere here? Now see the supplementary class notes on foreign currency translation. Okay, so IS21, that's recently joined the syllabus. So be careful of that. You must be aware of all these changes. So if I take you into your supplementary pack, which we were looking at when I looked at disposals of subsidiaries, <clears throat> that's our next concern. So where are we? The supplementary pack obviously is available in the uh, resources section of the, uh, on the on the platform and we did use it on disposals of subsidiaries done previously. There are three main changes to the syllabus. The third one is a very easy one, group interpretations. Um, it, when you're doing your ratios and interpretations, that kind of thing, return on capital employed, gross profitability, etc. What implications will there be if you're dealing with a group scenario rather than an individual company? So I've cobbled together a page of comments and so on, uh, just in case that comes up. And obviously on revision, we will do a proper question on that. But the one that we haven't done and must do before we come to our group interpretation in a couple of sessions time is a translation of foreign currency transactions. Okay, so if you turn to page nine, please, I'll show you where this is to be found. Translation of foreign currency transactions. Can I just say one thing? Um, it's, it sounds worse than it is. Okay, now the reason why things like disposals and foreign currency has been brought into F7 is people doing P2, which is, you know, the next level up, the highest level of financial reporting that ACCA do, uh, students coming up to doing it there get such a shock uh, because they've never come across the concept before. So what the ATC are doing is just introducing the idea of foreign currency, for example, at the lower level. So when you go upstairs to P2, you can see how foreign currency can be used when you're translating a foreign subsidiary before you consolidate. But that's not our concern in F F7. For F7, there's just a few transactions and some common sense rules. I would say it's only a tiny bit above common sense, this set of uh, rules with regard to foreign currency. Okay, so it's common sense with a couple of small rules and regulations. So it's nothing to be afraid of, but what I am concerned about is the fact that it has a very good chance of coming up at least as a, as a couple of MCQs, one of which I'll show you in this particular course. All right, here we are from the F7 study guide. Explain the difference between functional and presentation currency and explain why adjustments are necessary for foreign currency transactions. Okay, so what do you reckon this word functional means? Is that if I'm operating in the UK, I'll be using pounds, sterling. If I'm operating in the US, I'll use US dollars. Yes, if I'm operating in Sweden, for example, I might be using, what shall we say, Swedish krona or whatever it might be. If I'm operating in Italy, I might be using the euro. And so it goes on and on and on. So what we're saying is the functional currency is simply the currency that you operate in. Okay? If I'm in India, I'd be using rupees, Indian rupees, and so it goes on. The presentation currency is something quite different. That's how the currency in which you present your financial statements. 
So you might uh, choose to present in US dollars, even though you may be, um, your functional currency may be in, in Euro. Okay, so it just, it's a choice companies make, uh, presumably because they're parts of a, you know, they may be part of a bigger group, that kind of thing. So what you need to do is these half a dozen pages, you need to read every word. And in the college here, we've managed to put a few things together. And um, I'm presenting to you as a little bit of studying that you have to do. I've kept it as simple as possible, almost like you've never heard of foreign currency. And uh, this is what you need for F7. Obviously, one question in class, one question for homework, answers always fully explained. If you put in the time, you'll sail through this point. Very easy indeed. <clears throat> so, functional is the day-to-day -day currency. Presentation is what you do your financial statements in, should they be different. Explain why adjustments for foreign currency transactions are necessary. So I'll explain how that works. I suppose an easy way of understanding it is if you uh, buy something from me on credit, yes, um, when the time comes to actually paying me for the goods that you've bought, because the exchange rate has moved between the time of the transaction and the time of settlement, that difference in the exchange rate should be reflected. So if your currency gets stronger, you'll make a profit. If your currency gets weaker, I suppose you'll make a loss like that. So just common sense. People are afraid of it for some reason because it's new, but actually the level at which they examine it at F7 is extremely straightforward common sense level, like I say. All right, let's move on. Account for the translation of foreign, translation, I see, of foreign currency transactions and monetary and non-monetary foreign currency items at the reporting date. As you'd imagine, monetary are things like um, cash, bank, uh, receivables, payables, these are monetary. Whereas non-monetary are things like stock, inventory, property, plant, equipment, buildings, all that kind of thing, motor cars. Yes, so monetary is, uh, monetary includes, apart from the obvious, includes receivables and payables as well, don't forget. Okay, so can you tell the difference between monetary and non-monetary? Okay, and that's what the syllabus says we've got to cover. Nothing to do with foreign subsidiaries or associates or anything like that. That's yet to come at the next level, outside of F7. So let's have a little read through this. The effects of changes in foreign currency rates. This is your foreign exchange rates. This is your IS21. Useful to know some of these numbers and it gives some guidance. So what I'm going to do is to keep quiet for a minute while you read through some of those definitions to get familiar with what it's all about. So I'll keep quiet while you read that. Okay, so... Spot exchange rate is basically at the time of the transaction. What else? Fair value is how we understand it normally. Monetary, as I was saying, is your cash and bank as well as receivables and payables. Your functional currency is the currency of the primary economic environment in which the entity operates. So the country where you're operating, the currency there, that's the functional. And the presentation is what you present in. It's very, very simple indeed. You can imagine an MCQ teasing you. Are you clear that there is a distinction? And the person who hasn't touched this topic will have no idea whatsoever and will lose two marks. A person like you who's spending a few minutes with me here reading the notes will sail through it. It's very straightforward. Again, if I just give you a chance to read through functional and presentation currencies, please. A few more bits and pieces for you to remember on the next page. And then towards the end, the important point coming up, 
For example, a company may use pounds sterling, yes, as its functional currency because it's based in the UK, and keep its accounts in pounds sterling, but wish to present its financial statements in US dollars. Maybe its parent company is US, is American. All right, so that's all it means. Now, how do we go about it? What kind of level of examination question do we get? Let's play around with some of these concepts to get a bit more familiar and relaxed about it. Then I'll hit you with a typical multiple choice question because that's how I think it'll come up. Because remember, 60 marks of our exam are going to be on with MCQs, on MCQs and so on, lots and lots of standards. And one of the standards, of course, is IS21. So let's read through this line by line. As I say, there's one for me to do with you in class, another one for you to do for homework. And between the two, we'll easily cover anything that can come up for the next few sittings. Usually whenever there's anything brand new, our examiner, F7 examiner, tends to be quite uh, friendly in the first few sittings. And then a year down the line, he begins to set some serious questions. So let's get rid of this quite quickly like this sitting. Okay, initial recognition of foreign currency transactions. Now, let's understand what's going on. A foreign currency transaction is a transaction that is denominated in or requires settlement in, in a foreign currency. For example, when an entity buys or sells goods or services whose price is denominated in a foreign currency or borrows or lends funds in that currency. You understand the general context in which I'm writing that. A foreign currency transaction is initially recorded in the functional currency, of course, by translating the foreign currency amount at the spot rate of the date, rate of the date of the transaction. Here's an example. A company if a company purchases goods from an overseas supplier on the 1st of May, the exchange rate used to translate the purchase will be the rate in force at that time, of course. Alternatively, if an average rate for the year could be used, provided there have been no significant fluctuations throughout the year. That would be particularly useful where there are many, many transactions, many, many purchases, you see. So rather than keeping you know, a very tedious record of everything, every transaction, they just take an average for the year. That sounds more sensible, especially if there isn't any huge um, va variation. I put spot in brackets. Now here comes a real example or, or, or more. Um, a detailed example, a company called Ada. So you are a company called Ada, purchase goods and credit from a Swedish company. Uh, by the way, this is a really, really important rule. Key rule to learn. The stuff about there being no fluctuations and all that stuff. Okay, watch it. Right, let's go back. Where were we? <clears throat> Add up, that's you, purchase goods and credit from a Swedish company for 50,000 Swedish krona, S-E-K, let's call it, on the 1st of June, 2016. The exchange rate of the date of the transaction was one US dollar to 15 krona. Yeah, just whatever the question says, just use it. Add it initially rec recognizes the purchase and the financial statements as follows, you see. You debit purchases and credit payables, and you use the 15, the rate at the time of the transaction. See? And so you tap, tap into your calculator, you come to 3333. Three, three. Just round it off to the nearest dollar. So debit purchases, credit payables, like any old accounting. Now, when you're settling it up, things are a little bit different. So basically, if I can just say, so, Ada owes the Swedish company 3,333, whatever. So I'll try to keep it very, very simple. And this is on the 1st of June, 2016. Now, here comes the settlement of this transaction. The settlement of a foreign currency transaction is recorded in the prevailing exchange rate on the date of the settlement. Fine. So this is, we're talking about the settlement. Earlier we're looking at the initial transaction. 
As this exchange is likely to differ from that at which the transaction was originally recognized, true, there will be an exchange difference. So if you use the previous example, assume that ADA actually pays the Swedish company the 50,000 it owed a month later, say on that date, so June to July, one month later. And let's say the exchange rate is 15.5. Now what that means is the dollar, please write, has strengthened. Therefore, fewer dollars needed to pay off the Swedish company. Okay, so to show you how easy this thing really is. And so the language of accountancy, you might get to, to do some debits and credits, journal entries in the exam, the language of accountancy, never forget the debits and credits. Uh, what I've done is I've debited payables to cancel payables. Payables normally is a credit. If you remember earlier, we debited purchases and credited payables. Now I'm paying it off, you are paying it off. So you debit payables to get rid of the 3333. Three, three, three. That's gone. And the credit goes to cash because you're paying out cash. And this happens on the 1st of July, 16. And because the exchange rate is, uh, for, from the dollar point of view, has become stronger, in other words, each dollar is worth not 15, but 15.5, um, adder, that's you, had to pay a little bit less. And that is measured by a 107 exchange gain. Yes. So where that goes, etc., we'll have a look. Somewhere in the PL, you'd imagine. Now, that's if it's all settled and so on. But now, at the end of the year, the end of the period, foreign currency items might not be settled, see, or realized before the end of the reporting period in which, in which the related transaction took place. At the end of each reporting period, what do you do? Here are some rules, and then we put the rules into practice. The foreign currency monetary items, things like cash, payables, receivables, are retranslated. Okay. So whatever they were at the, at the time of the transaction, you've got to retranslate them to the year, as at the year end. So that's a big word, re. And then that's monetary. If you have non-monetary, they are not retranslated. So the way I remember it, I tell my students to remember it, is non, not, non, not, easy. And the fair value obviously is the same. That also is not translated. <clears throat> Continuing with our early example, ADA, that's you, does not pay on the 1st of July 2016 and that it has not paid for the goods by its year end, which happens to be about a month later. Okay, the exchange rate at this date is the, the, the dollar's got much stronger and the goods are still in inventory, in other words, unsold. at SFP date. ADA has already initially recorded the goods in the financial statements on this as follows. Debit purchases, credit payables. If I take you back a long time ago here. Debit purchases, credit payables. This is so easy. So that's in the books you see. As a payable is a monetary item, remember, it must be retranslated. And because you're using 18 and the dollars got stronger, that 3333 three, three, three is down to just 2778 because you're paying with a more powerful currency. As a result of the exchange rate movement, ADA has made an exchange gain, you see, so it hasn't been paid, it's just retranslated, it hasn't yet been paid. Okay, and so you have a gain of something like $555. Yes, so that's the 333 was the original, now it's 2778. 
The inventory is a non-monetary item, and so it will be included in the financial statements that is the original cost of 3333. Now, I'll just draw a line about there, please, if you would kindly with me. Let's move on. Now, assume that Ada pays for the goods on the 15th of August, so that's a couple of weeks after the year end, when the exchange rate is 16, so it's gone backwards, the exchange rate has gone backwards a little bit, the dollar has weakened. What was it before? 18, wasn't it? Now it's gone down to 16, has weakened during the two weeks. after the year end date. So what do we do with this? The payable obviously is 2778. That's what you've got to bring into play to cancel. See that? The payable is 2888. because of the retranslation. So that old 2888, you are, yep, you are now cancelling. And of course, because you were optimistic and used 18 earlier, but now you only have 16, uh, the, uh, the exchange rate is only 16, you've actually lost something, you see. So that's how it all works out. Very, very easy indeed. And the examiner has told us that this is the level at which he's going to be examining it. Okay, through little inquiries I've made. Okay, foreign currency transactions, moving on to the next page. Exchange differences. As we've seen in the examples, exchange differences may arise on the settlement of a foreign currency item or the retranslation. So if you pay, settle up your payables, of course there'll be an exchange, if, if the exchange rate has moved, there could be a loss or a gain. Or if you retranslate equally, there could be a loss or a gain. Okay, at the period end. These exchange differences are recognized in profit and loss in the period in which they, are, they arise. An exchange gain or loss on a monetary item is recognized in other comprehensive income, you see, if it's a revaluation re gain, in other words, if it's a normal revaluation re gain, we're talking about a revaluation re surplus a little bit earlier, same sort of thing. And in the profit and loss, if indeed it's just, if it's something like an investment property. As you know, if you have investment properties, the change in, in value goes to the main PL. Okay, so let's write the word main PL there. So if it is an investment property, a special kind of, the examiner will explain it as such, um, then because your investment property ex uh, changes in value go to the main P&L, if you translate it, obviously it goes to the main P&L. So it follows the same rules as for normal. But if it's just a normal um, um, building that you're revaluing, and there's a revaluation re surplus, naturally that doesn't go to the main PL, it goes to the OCI, other comprehensive income. So it must go down there. Okay, please be careful. So here's a bit, a bit of a summary for you. Um, a foreign currency, uh, a summary of foreign currency transactions are translated into the functional currency of an entity using the spot exchange rate at the date of the, time of the transaction. And exchange differences arise where monetary items are retranslated at the period end or need a foreign item is settled and because you're using a slightly different uh, uh, value, uh, uh, more uh, stronger, weaker uh, currency in that sense, you will make a profit or a loss. So that's a quick synopsis. So here's a little MCQ. I want you to read it and see if you can come up with an answer, please. I'll keep quiet.
So what do you think? When a single entity makes purchases or sales in a foreign currency, it will be necessary to translate the transactions into its functional currency, that's true, before the transaction can be included in the financial records. In course with the IIS, which of the following function, fu foreign currency exchange rates may be used? What kind of rates may be used to translate foreign currency purchases and sales? The rate which existed on the day that the purchase or sale took place. That looks pretty good, doesn't it? The rate which existed at the beginning. Don't like that. The rate which existed at the end. Don't like that. What's that middle one there? An average rate for the year provided there have been no significant fluctuate. Absolutely fine. And the answer, of course, is D. If you know your stuff, these MCQs take literally a few seconds to do. Okay, there's no huge amount to write. You just read it, think about it, say, oh yes, I remember that supplementary uh, class notes that Francis did in class. And I know exactly how to do that. D, one and three, and that's two marks coming your way. As you can see, no numbers on something like this. Um, it's just, you know, you read it and you get it. And that's from the past exam question, a spec the specimen exam to the new syllabus. And of course, some homework examples, inevitably, with full solutions <coughs> supplied by me. All right. And when I see you in a couple of sessions time, I hope to be doing some interpretation. So that's for another day. So you can see there, foreign currency, nothing to be afraid of. But it's just one of those things where it's knowledge. One of our directors says, Rob Sahabi says that the new exam is all about knowledge, knowledge, knowledge. And I think that's true. Yes, when I listen to him, he's a very, very experienced lecturer, brilliant lecturer, does F9 and stuff like that. And he says, you know, he's telling all of us other lecturers, you know, students are now just being tested on knowledge. Okay, there are a couple of big 20 mark questions on F7 where you have to do the detail of published accounts and consolidations and ratios and all that. But the rest of the 60 marks are just little bits of knowledge. And so if you know your class notes and these little uh, things we're doing, the principles, you're going to sail through those 60 marks. But if you take a chance and say, I'll just study these four topics or whatever, and then there's definite failure facing you. You have to cover the entire syllabus, which makes it even more likely that people who do many subjects will find it hard these days. You've got to cut it down a bit, only do what's absolutely essential for each subject. All right, let's go back to our class notes. <coughs> We've spent a few minutes on foreign currency. That's how long it takes. It takes about half an hour, probably another half an hour for you to study it and uh, do the homework. One hour, that's it. That's all you need. All right, published accounts advanced. Now we're moving back. Let me see if I can link this up to our study program. We've done the some more work on tax one of these questions. We've done the supplementary stuff on foreign currency. And in the remaining hour or so that we have on this session, I'd like to pick up Lama, which takes about five minutes to do, a bigger one called Altered, and then uh, something on provisions and contingency. It'd be nice to get those out of the way, because as you can see, when I see you next time, we've got quite a lot to do anyway. Okay, and then as time goes on, when I see you, is it next week, whatever, uh, we'll pick up the supplementary pack group interpretations. So bring that pack in, please, or we'll have access to it, as I was showing you a few minutes ago. So there are small changes, but the paper is already very burdened with huge, huge amounts of work, which is why when I started the session, I was warning some people who haven't done any work, who are still struggling with the basics of consolidation, it means you won't make it by the 6th of September unless you completely change your approach to F7. F7 is not difficult, it's just very, very big, made bigger by disposals of subsidiaries and um, foreign currency and so on. So, But that's something you've got to sort out. All right. 
Publish accounts advanced. A few bits and pieces. Uh, a long time ago in chapter four, we did the question called Intercept. I've referred to that a couple of times. Then I set you questions like Forest and Winger for homework. <clears throat> or certainly I set you Forest for homework. Some people have asked me about Forest. So now I would ask you to do Winger. Winger for homework. Uh, page 94. Don't forget that publisher counts could be the large 20 mark question in the exam. Okay, just as consolidations or ratios maybe a 20 marker. Um, more than half the marks, well over half the marks in the exam, when you've got your publish accounts questions, will be on standards. And you need the, if you take the paper as a whole, something like 60% of the paper might be published in standards. Okay, so within the published, more than half maybe on standards. But if you take published and standards together, out of the 100 marks, it could well be 60 marks. Okay, sometimes a trial balance, you know what a trial balance is? So you're the main accountant, I'm the little bookkeeper. Um, I'm not ACC qualified, suppose. And all I can do is a bit of bookkeeping, maybe I do AT or something, I'm not sure. And uh, you know, so that sort of book, institute of bookkeepers or some qualification like that. And I'm very good at debits and credits. So I do these little T accounts and I produce what's known as a trial balance. I hand it over to you and you take a look at it and say, well, it doesn't quite um, m uh, match up with what I was expecting. Because I noticed right at the end here, you brought in something called a suspense account to make the debits equal the credits. And so what the examiner will say to you, suppose you are some ACCA qualified person and a person who is a bookkeeper has handed it over to you because of little problems, would you, as an experienced, book, uh, experienced ACCA qualified person, would you be able to sort out the problems the bookkeeper has had? And of course that means you've got to be good on debits and credits. So I'll take you very slowly through an answer uh, just to show you how to dig deep. Before that, let's have a little read of this. Sometimes a trial balance will not agree and the question will suspend the difference in something called a suspense account, which eventually must be eliminated. And so you're the expert, the ACCA qualified. And here we have an extract uh, from uh, a question a few Decembers ago called Lama. So I've picked out a couple of paragraphs from there and just made it into a little knowledge test. And so in the exam, what will happen, this will be dressed up as a two mark MCQ. And you read it and you say, all oh, right, it's A or B or whatever it might be. Right, the trial balance of the above company, Lama, and that date shows ordinary share capital at 60,000 and 50 cent shares. So can I say there's 120,000 shares? And there's no share premium balance. The suspense account balance of 24,000 contains a corresponding credit entry. So that's a credit. And so basically I've got to hit it with debits to get rid of it. For the proceeds of a rights issue, a rights issue is simply a, an issue of shares to existing shareholders. So you're the company and I'm a shareholder. Me and my friends are shareholders. And uh, because we are invested in your company already, we think of you very positively. So if you're trying to raise more money rather than offering it to the public who don't know who your company is possibly, you might as well offer it to me preaching to the converted because we're already shareholders. And if we have the money, we'd like to invest and buy more shares in your company, especially if the share price is say 160 cents, the market value of the shares, but you're offering it at say half price, 80 cents. Okay, so what's known as a rights issue. So when the company is trying to raise more money, it might offer those, these, the new shares it's trying to raise money with, might offer those shares to existing shareholders who by right have a, a right of first refusal, that kind of idea. Now we come across rights issues a bit more in detail a little later on in a couple of sessions time when we do um, things like earnings per share. Okay, but today it's just a brief look at it. 
sort of rights issues, just a, an issue of shares sometime during the year. The, I'm going to say that the full share price market value is say 160 cents. I just made that up. And you're offering at 80 cents per share. And because the nominal value, the par value of the shares is 50 cents, what we're saying is the ordinary share capital par value has got to be the 50 cents each and the excess share premium is 30 cents, also known as other components of equity. Okay, so share premium is sometimes called other components of equity. Okay, so share premium. So how do we get all this together? So what are the figures for ordinary share capital and share premium that must be shown in the statement of financial position? Now, just a couple of things to look out for. Number one, if the share uh, price uh, is, say, 160 cents, and the rights issue is made at, at 80 cents, it's made at a huge discount. And there's a good chance that it will be a successful issue because the existing shareholders are prepared to have their shares invested in the company, the money invested in the company, at 160 cents per share. And if you offer at half price, they're most likely to say yes, because they're happy with 160. 80 is a huge, huge discount. Okay, that's one point. The other point, I suppose, is you mustn't mess up the par value and the excess going to share premium. And of course, a side issue is the, sh the suspense account must disappear. So how do we convert that into a chunk of marks? Yes, as I was saying to you when I started the session, I've been doing a little bit of studying myself, a little bit of research, um, making inquiries, etc., through friends who know the examiner, etc., that looking at the specimen paper to the new syllabus effective from September, more than 60% of the exam seems to have been on published and standards. So never ignore the standards. Published is standards. The vast majority of published is standards. So what we're saying is our paper is dominated by these standards more than before. So let's write out an answer to the Lama page 210. All these are past exam questions. Let's start off with the suspense account. <clears throat> I might make this a little bit thicker actually, so sorry. Is a 24,000 credit balance. And basically, it needs to be eliminated. Before we do that, let's have a look. The ordinary share capital is 60,000, but in 50 cent shares, i.e., there's 120,000 shares. Okay, so, and the rights issue is 120,000 divided by 4, multiplied by 1, so there's 30,000 new shares being issued to existing shareholders. So what the good student will do is debit suspense account. with the 24,000. The suspense account started life as a credit of 24,000 
If you debit it, it'll become zero. You see? And the leftover, or the other side of the entry, is to transfer to the ordinary share capital 30,000 shares at the rate of 50 cents, which is obviously 15,000. And the leftover beyond that, the share premium, has got to be the 30,000 shares at the rate of 30 cents, which is 9. So whenever you do things like that, you must make sure that this equals this. Okay, be careful. So the, the rights issue is one for four, says the question. So if you take your 120,000 shares, you divide by four, multiply by one, 30,000 new shares. So you just put that into, pra into place like that. So what does the new SFB look like? So final answer. Let me do a big version of suspense in a minute. What can I say? The original plus the new issue equals the final figures. <coughs> Financial position figures, excuse me. Right, so the share capital is it used to be 60,000 the share premium was nil and the new issues are <coughs> excuse me 15 and 9 <coughs> beg your pardon and so this is 75 and this is 9, so this is 84. Obviously this is 24. <coughs> and that's how to complete that particular question. You're now moving on to the next page. Take you into your class notes, beg your pardon. Page 211, redrafting. So what's happened is the inexperienced bookkeeper, let's, let's say me, has produced a set of accounts, but has got a few mistakes in it. I'm, I'm not too sure about leasing and things like that. I'm in a little bit weak on my standards and so you as the ACCA expert picks up this the set of accounts gets rid of suspense puts leasing in its right place etc and uh, that basically is the flavor of the question so make a start please can I give you a ch chance to read altered and make a start So how do we do a question like this? If I go to the end of the second page, like we did the other day with the question called interceptor, we use what's known as the oral method. In other words, you open up your required accounts. You then read the question. You then adjust for additional information and then line by line solve. 
Okay, so the oral technique. So redraft the statement of financial position and make appropriate adjustments. <coughs> so in the exam, you'll open up, excuse me, one page for the um, statement of financial position. Let's actually do that. So we're going to say altered page 211, redraft the statement of financial position. So we're going to say redrafted SFP as at 31st December 2014. And can I recommend two pages so you can show all your little steps all right so let's do that move on to page three please when you're ready this is where i would like you to open up what the question says a show all workings and a separate calculation for retained earnings so let's say calculation for the retained earnings altered question and then what is now page four let's do some workings so we use this oral technique open up required accounts read the question make your adjustments line by line solve now since we've opened up can I ask you now to read the question page 211 and page 212 I'll keep quiet for a few seconds while you get familiar with those two pages, please. <clears throat> 211, 212. So what do we have here? Let's go back, see if I can catch up with you. The question says, this is really easy stuff if you know your basics, the draft, so it sounds like it's not perfect, the bookkeeper's made some mistakes. A statement of financial position has been prepared like this, cost accumulated depreciation net book value, just use choose the same layout as per the original analysis on blatant mistake just a uh, choice that direct the directors are made of pre presenting like this so no foreign currency any troubles for us here very straightforward cost depreciation net book value looks good inventories receivables cash at bank nothing to report the shares are 50 cents each so for whatever it's, whatever it's worth 12,000 shares, just in case, like our Lama question. Retained earnings, this is the unadjusted. In a few minutes, I hope to have an adjusted version. And then the loan notes, etc. And of course, the suspense account, this must be a credit, because obviously it's mixed up with equity and liabilities. And what we've got to do is so somehow attack it and get a debit out of it. Or hit it with the debit, I should say. And so we move on to the next page. The following additional information is available. So we're now doing all our adjustments. New plant with a cash price of 600000 was accidentally treated as an operating lease. But it's supposed to have, uh, and they've charged the PL with 150000 but after consultation with the experts, it was considered more appropriate to regard it as a financial lease. That's correct. Depreciation of 120 and finance costs of 50. So basically, this company has fallen foul of IAS 17, 
the inexperienced bookkeeper hasn't followed the standard properly and so has charged 150 to the PL, but they should have charged really 120 plus 50, 170. So because they've charged 150 only, but they should have charged 170, what you've got to do is to charge another 20. And that becomes the adjustment. And then they've given you the year end figures that go into the SFP in due course. Okay, so let me show you how to bring that through. Just to save a little bit of time, I thought I'd give you all my detailed workings. If you would turn kindly to page 452. <clears throat> uh, make that Make that 454. Right, now, let's see where we are. Let's say about page four. <coughs> Leasing, I was saying to you, if you turn to page 454, the Operating lease rental payment is 150, but we should have charged 170. So what do we do? Do we charge another 20 to the PL? And if you're doing your SFP extracts, obviously the finance leased asset of 600, you take away depreciation of 120. And so the net book value is 480. And of course you see there at the end of paragraph one, 500 is what goes to the SFP. Okay, so you can't do the SFP as you go along, but you can certainly do the PL. The SFP needs to be put through as in a very formal sort of style, um, the layout. So let's go back to our page three. Uh, this is from your original. If you turn to your page 211, you can see that the retained earnings at the start of the year, the unadjusted, is 12,400. So please write unadjusted like that there, 12,400. Uh, the adjustments, 20,000 must be deducted because obviously they've charged 150, they should have charged 170. And that's the end of that. Very straightforward indeed. We'll do the SFB later. We then come across some revaluations. So let me go back to my question paper and see if I can pick this up. So the first item is done. Let's move on to the second one. It has been decided to revalue the land and buildings to 12 million at the end of the year. What was it going back to the first page? You can see the land and buildings are standing at eight and apparently we've got to make that eight into 12. So the revaluation surplus, mentioned that earlier today, is plus four, another 4,000. Okay, and so you just deal with that. <clears throat> so let's stick that off in anticipation of doing it. So where's my answer? So going back to page 454, you see all the detail there, so I can just explain. And so you have a little bit of time, not just writing, but thinking about it as well. So the revaluation we were saying in the original question was 8,000 net book value. That needs to go up by 4,000. So how do, you, how do we do it? We debit cost, we debit accumulated depreciation, and you credit revaluation reserve. So this is the first thing you do. You do the revaluation first, you do the second, in other words, you reverse the old depreciation, you see. You reverse the old depreciation and whatever's left goes to cost. So that's like the third thing you do. So the revaluation reserve, the difference between 8 and 12 is 4. It's almost like the, the original cost was 9,000, it went down to 8. And because the 9,000 was the original cost, as you get from 8 up to 12, you, you go, go past the 9 level. 
So the depreciation of 1,000, you're just reversing, and then you're adding another 3,000 to take it up. Okay, so that's the idea behind it. Um, the reason why we have our journal entry set up in that style. Now, you will notice it has no P&L effects because clearly if you have a revaluation, you don't have to put that into your P&L. Certainly no main P&L effects. No P&L effects. This is the main P&L. You're only doing a main P&L. You're not doing the OCI in this, in, in this particular example. All right, let's get back to our question paper. Trade receivables totaling 200,000 to be written off. Now that's extremely straightforward. That's basically a bad debt. And then there's a contra settlement of 106 in which an amount due to a supplier was set off against the amount due from the same supplier. So that's another little thing we could easily handle. So I'm going to do those two entries together as we start moving. So we've dealt with the revaluation. Here comes the bad debt. The way we do it is we debit our PL and we credit our receivables because you're writing off a bad debt. The contra, of course, if you want to cancel a payable, you must debit it, like we saw in our foreign currency, of course, and you'll credit the receivable because receivables normally are debits. To cancel, you would credit it. And that also has no PL effects. But the retained earnings obviously does go to the PL. That goes to your page three. So let's go back, have a look at how all this features, where it features. The bad debt's written off, trade receivables written off, the goes through there, and as I was saying a moment or two ago, the contra settlement, like we've done on consolidations many times, that has no PL effects. All right, let's dig deeper. We've got some inventory now to handle. So if I take you back to page 212, please. <clears throat> it says there some inventory items included in the draft statement of financial position at a cost of 500 draft gives you the impression that there's some mistake there inexperienced bookkeeper maybe the inventory stands at 500,000 was sold just after the year end for 400,000 with selling expenses of 40 so the net selling or the net realizable value I suppose is just 360 but the cost is said to be 500 so clearly if, our, if after the year end so you've got a year end and then a few weeks later before the accounts are authorized for issue by the directors the, they find that the inventory, which is at the year end at 500, is worth only, six, only 360. That means there's a write-off needed of 140. So if you're prudent, even though at the year end you haven't actually sold the goods, the sale occurred after the year end, but there's another IS, IS10, which says that events after the reporting period must be reflected if they throw light on the true value of the inventory as at the year end. Okay, so I've explained all this in my detailed answer. So I'll just give it a bit of a tick. It's quite straightforward. We've come across inventory in the past, when I saw you last time, for example. So basically, if you've got inventory at 500 in your books, but when the time comes to selling it, you realize that the 500 is only worth 360. If you're being prudent, you must allow for the 140 to be written off to the PL. And that basically is the message here. So here's your inventory. IS2 says it must be valued at the lower of cost and net realizer value. The lower of cost of 500 and 360. 
So which one's lower? 306, 360. Therefore, you write off 140 from inventory and from profit. Okay, so you debit your PL and you credit your inventory. This is so easy. Now, in not doing the SFP just yet, that's your closing inventory, of course. Do that as a last step. But the PL definitely can write off. You must write off to the PL. So let's go back. Here we are. The inventory written off or written down 140. Um, even though that happens after the year end, uh, you have to reflect it. It's known as an adjusting post balance sheet event. So, can you just add something here? IS10 says this 140 is an adjusting, the figures are adjusted, event after the reporting period, EARP. Okay, so if you try to sell the goods which at the year end were worth 500, before the directors finalize the accounts for the year just gone by, if they realize that when they try to sell it for 500, they could only raise 360 for, for it, clearly the 140 is an overvaluation of closing stock. So that's why it has to be eliminated. Seems prudent and common sense accounting. Okay, so now we're coming to our good friend suspense. So better take you back to your page 212. <coughs> as we pick up the next piece of this battle. The suspense account is made up of two items. Two items? Well, it says so. The suspense account on the previous page was 5,000. Now, be careful. The proceeds of issue of, this is a bit like llama. Proceeds of issue of 4 million 50 cent shares, by the way, at $1.10 raises 4,400 in thousands. And it's credited to suspense account from the cash book. The cash book is fine, but the credit to suspense, we must get rid of it. The balance of the account, I reckon the word balance must mean 600. <coughs> Because 5,000 is a credit, if you get rid of 4,400 as a debit, what's left, of course, is 600. So I'll show you how that works. The balance of the account is the proceeds of sale of some plant, as at that date with a net book value at the date of sale of 700, and which had originally cost 1.4 million. So I reckon the accumulated depreciation here must be that, with that taken off, 700. No other accounting entries have yet been made for the disposal apart from the cash book entry for the receipt of the proceeds. Depreciation on plants has been charged at 25% straight line basis in preparing the draft statement of financial position without allowing for the sale. Okay, so that's an error. The depreciation for the year should be adjusted for in full. So without allowing is an error made to be corrected. So what we're going to say is the depreciation rate at the rate of 25% multiplied by whatever that was, 1,400. That figure there, 350. is, I suppose, the over-depreciation. What's happened is the bookkeeper didn't realize that the item had been sold, and so has carried on doing the depreciation. So what you've got to do is to add that back to profit to compensate for the over-depreciation, something like that. So let's conclude, therefore, 
I'll do this slowly. It's a little bit of a tricky business, but we've done Lama half an hour ago, very similar to this. Share issue, 4,000 shares in thousands, $1.10. So this is the issue price. Please write issue price, proceeds. <coughs> the proceeds of 4,400 must not be credited, <coughs> excuse me, to the suspense account, but to the share capital and share premium as follows. Obviously, you debit your suspense account and you credit your share capital and the share premium. And uh, the share premium, of course, is the difference between the share capital, 50 cents, and of course, the $1.10, which is the issue price. Not unlike our rights issue earlier. So by doing that, you're debiting suspense Suspense started off as a credit of 5,000 and so because you've got a suspense of 5,000 credit less the shares here, the leftover of your suspense is, a deb is 600 which is a credit and if I cancel it I must debit it. Okay, to finally remove. And you credit something called a disposal account. Don't be worried about, about the disposal account. It's one of those things that we do in F3, the lower level. And eventually it all disappears anyway. So, but it's something that helps it to hold, hold everything together. <clears throat> right, excuse me. Proceeds on disposal. Suspense now is nil, of course. Remember the suspense started life on 5,000. We got rid of 4,400. And we got rid of 600. And so the suspense actually equals zero. <coughs> Sorry. Oh, all right. So you debit your suspense to get rid of it, and you credit the disposal account. That's the proceeds on disposal according to part B of the question, part B, 6B. And if 600 is a proceeds, is there a profit or a loss? And the answer is yes. If the sale proceeds is 600 and the net book value is 700, the loss on disposal, therefore, must be, seven, uh, must be 100. And to make sure that the SFB balances, you need to go through these little steps. You debit the disposal with the cost, you credit the disposal with the depreciation, and the leftover goes to the PL as the loss. And if I can just say the disposal account disappears. The disposal account, on the debit side, you had 1400. On the credit side, you had 700 and 100. And up here, of course, we had a disposal reference. Was it 600, something like that? There we are. So if you were to add these up, The disposal account has disappeared. <clears throat> the depreciation charge and error we decided was 350, as you can see there. And so that must come through as well. So let's go have a look at our PL to see where all this sits. So I was only going to make a start on the question. I want you to finish it for homework, but we've done virtually everything, but you still will still benefit from you doing a little bit more on it. So here we are, back to our page three. The loss on disposal in brackets, the depreciation charge and error, added back to profit, of course, and therefore the adjusted profit from 12,400 becomes 12,220. And that 12,220 is then slotted into the big SFP. As you can see here the redrafted, so this is for homework, obviously. 
line by line, pick up all the little adjustments and you'll see me explaining everything. And of course, this is our p &L. Okay, so the famous redrafting, be careful of that. So once you put through the various little adjustments, well, actually, you, if you attempt the balance sheet yourself and then check the answer, that would be more beneficial. Otherwise, I'd like to go back to page 212 and start our last topic of the afternoon. Quite a busy 16 hours with this massive syllabus that we're faced with, especially with all the additions, foreign currency and disposals, etc. Okay, so there are some essential homework exercises to get you ready for the possible 20 mark question on published. There's a question called York, a couple of pages long. And another one called New, New and York, two questions for you to practice. Detailed answers I've done at the back for you to check. So the more published you do, the more relaxed you'll be about how all these standards are dealt with. Okay. So please look at all those examples. Also the question called forest. That's a really good question, which many people have asked me through email about. So obviously people are doing it. <coughs> Beyond that, provisions, contingencies, and events after the reporting period. Now that's something we've come across just now. E-A-R-P. This is your IS-10, whereas provisions is IS-37. This is more important. You might get a, a couple of MCQ four marks or whatever on uh, events after the reporting period, but the big one, of course, is the first one, uh, provisions and contingencies. All right, so that's where I would like to take you as we conclude. Let me just confirm that we're on track. The study program we've done, Lama, altered we've made a start for you to finish and so there's a small question called Eden which is all about provisions etc okay and as you can see on the videos these are all the video references you'll see me explaining this in a little bit more detail explaining some of the homework occasionally so that's what we need to have to get done in the next 20 odd minutes that we have left so let's go have a look at our this is not much more than common sense, actually. So, provisions and contingencies, the examiner likes that. I've seen that all over the specimen paper, um, indicating what's going to come up in September. And events after the reporting period, an example there, of course, is at the year end, you have stock of 500. And when you try to sell it, you can only get 360. So the 140 becomes something to be written off to the PNL, like we were saying with the question called altered, that kind of thing. But obviously there's a bit for you to read there yourself. Small little standards, but worth it, worth studying. Right, introduction, a frequent visitor to the paper, as I say, as I say, <coughs> often in a published accounts question. Um, So, might get it all over the place. Could be part of objective test, questions, MCQs, etc. So, why an accounting standard is required on provisions? <clears throat> it's quite simple, really. You see, the, um, what was happening was um, we had this concept of prudence, uh, time honored accounting technique accounting principle that people were abusing. Let me show you how they would abuse it. Let's suppose I'm a director in charge of the accounts and the um, shareholders are expecting, say, I don't know, uh, three million profit or whatever it might be. But this year I've made a million, I've made a five million profit. Okay. And so that I've made too much profit in the eyes of the shareholders. But as I come to the end of the year, I suddenly realized that it, for my industry, for my company, in the coming year, there's going to be a downturn in that sector of the economy where my company operates. Maybe I'm a small company. Okay, so I've made a much bigger profit than the shareholders are expecting. But as I come towards the end of the year, I'm hearing there's going to be a recession in my industry 
and so my company might well be making losses. So what some companies do, some, some directors have been doing, is the excess profit they've made in this good year, they tend to debit to PNL and credit to provisions, hide it away somewhere, maybe it's head office refurbishing. Yes. So the debit the PNL, thereby reducing this year's excessive profit. And then in the new year, when they come into the head office and have a look at it towards the end of the second year, in the new year, they look at the head office and say, actually, it's not so bad after all. We debited PNL and we credited provision. We don't need that provision anymore. So let's reverse it. Let's debit our provision and credit our PNL. And thereby what they've achieved is something called profit smoothing. And that is not allowed. What I'd like you to do, please, is to move on to, say, a couple of pages time. Page 223. See that? Page 223. Into that page 223, I'd like to show you a little diagram that I'd like you to do. Okay. So let me show you what I mean by that. <clears throat> if I, let's say, if I go back to my class notes, so sorry. <clears throat> On page two, two, three. Of your class notes, I'd like you to do this little diagram, please. So, here's the first image. So, I've got two lines. The line on the left is a profit line, the one, the one that's lying down is a loss line. So, you have a profit line and then a loss line, uh, sorry, um, timeline. And below that, there's a loss. Okay, so first of all, the profit, let's say it's a five million profit that the company has made this year much higher than the two million that the um, uh, shareholders may be expecting. Okay, it's a much bigger profit than the shareholders are expecting. Okay, so if you could draw two lines of that, one a curly line and one a straight line, please. If you copy out that diagram, I'll be grateful. Once you're ready, I'm going to then debit my PL with 3 million and credit the provision with 3 million. I normally make a profit of 2 million, but I made a profit of 5 million this year. So what I've done is I've hidden away 3 million, maybe head office for refurbishing. Okay, so jot that down. Do a little shaded bit there. So debit your PL with 3 million and credit the provision with 3 million. Okay. Now comes the next step. A bit of profit smoothing going on to fill the gap. So what I've done is I've picked up my shaded bit on the left and pushed it to the right into the new year. So in the first year I debited PL 3 million and accredited provision with 3 million. In the new year I'm doing it the other way around, debit provision and credit PL. I look at the head office and say, well, actually, it's okay. I shouldn't have made that provision last year. So these are what unscrupulous directors do. Okay. And so to complete the idea, that kind of profit smoothing where you're moving profits from a good year into a bad year, that is not allowed anymore. That's one of the big reasons why we've had this IIS on the subject. Okay. So that's the end product, the, the finished article, a little diagram that I wanted you to jot down. Take your time in case you ask to explain <clears throat> and sometimes you get a chance to do some writing in your interpretation questions or indeed publish accounts questions. So, but it's mainly the idea that I wanted to get across to you. All right, point made. Let's move back to our class notes. So why an accounting standard on provisions is necessary? 
So can I just say C page two to three, a little diagram. Okay. We're now moving into other bits and pieces on this very easy standard. Definitions from the IAS. Provisions. A provision is a liability of uncertain timing or amount. Notice the provision must be a liability. Uh, by the way, the reason why we've had this problem is the um, the prudence concept being abused. Okay, so that's what you need to read, pick it up. Right, provisions. What are provisions? Provisions are, uh, provisions. a provision must be a liability, and so you can't just make um, a provision for, as the International Accounting Standards body says, a glint in the director's eye. It's got to be a real, real provision. In other words, if I want to get the head, of, head office to be refurbished, I've got to sign a contract with a building contractor who comes in and spends those millions and I've got a contract that's signed. So I can't get out of it and change my mind and write it back to the PNL next year. So if it is a proper liability, that's okay. Then you can make that provision. So it has to be a liability. So what's a liability? You may be asked this through an MCQ, of course. It's a present obligation of the entity arising from past events, the settlement of which is expected to result in an outflow of resources embodying future benefits, economic benefits. That's cash. Cash outflows. So what's an obligating event? You see the word obligation there. An obligating event is an event that creates a legal or constructive obligation. A legal is very easy, of course, but constructive is the one that comes up. Constructive obligation that it results in an entity having no realistic alternative to settling up. The kind of idea the examiner has here is, uh, let's say if you're a big oil company, say BP, the famous international company, digging for oil in a particular country with that, com com that uh, company's government's permission, the undertaking always is, if BP have put out this policy, they might say, well, Anywhere that we dig for oil, when we leave that area, having got the oil out of it and paid all our taxes and all that kind of thing, when we leave the area, we're going to make sure that the area is as good, as sound and as attractive as when we arrived. So if there are forests that have been devastated because of the huge driller, drilling equipment that goes in, the forests will have to be replanted, etc. And all that costs money. So what we're saying is, if they have undertaken to always make good the area where they've dug for oil, if they go to a new country, that new country will expect them to, to behave in exactly the same way as they've uh, announced that they would. You see? So that's the kind of thing we're talking about. So it's very much common sense. But our examiner likes these green issues, these environmental issues. It's so legal, there's no problem there, you can read that yourself. But have a look at this constructive obligation, that's the big one. <coughs> Excuse me, derives from an entity's actions whereby an established pattern of past practice, published policies, or a sufficiently specific current statement, the entity has indicated to other parties that it will accept certain responsibilities. And as a result, the entity has created a valid expectation on the uh, part of those other parties that they will discharge these responsibilities. So the best example I can think of is e.g. Uh, environmental provisions needed to be made by big oil companies. <clears throat> Another example is um, 
In the UK, we have a company called Tesco's. You may have heard of them. Uh, I've got here a little um, receipt from a Tesco purchase recently. And it says there on the reverse side, if you, if you change your mind about your purchase, please retain your receipt and return it to us, to the store, uh, with the product, this receipt with the product, as sold within 30 days and you get your money back. Okay, that's Tesco's. There's another company called Marks and Spencers, uh, which you've heard of, no doubt. Um, they have a policy of return and refund for 35 days. You see? So if I bought some goods from a company called Marks and Spencers, you've heard of them, big retail store, and the goods, let's say a shirt or whatever, doesn't quite fit, I can take it back over the next 35 days and get my money back. Uh, there are other companies that give even longer to, uh, time to return. There's a famous company called IKEA or IKEA, I don't know how you say it, a big furniture company. And I understand they take goods back for one year. Now, I'm not too concerned about the marketing and so on involved with that. That's a different issue altogether. But what I am concerned about is if I'm the accountant, if you're the accountant for a company like IKEA, at the big furniture company and they they take goods back for a whole year after they've sold them what kind of provision do you make at the year end and the only way they can handle it is they can say well last year we've had this policy for many many years of course last year we had about 10 percent of the goods coming back of what we sold by the year end in the year before that we had 12 percent coming back so if you take an average of 10 and 12 say 11 maybe you should make a provision for 11 for this year you see, percent. So that's how they do it. They base it on past experience. Okay, so environmental provisions, <clears throat> as I say there. There's another one called contingent liabilities. Contingent liabilities. And there you have it. A possible obligation that arises from past events and, and whose existence will be confirmed only by the occurrence or non-occurrence of one or more uncertain future events, not wholly within the control. The best example, of course, here is your um, a legal case, e.g. a legal decision pending. Uh, someone is suing the company, some in, uh, employee may be suing the company for unfair dismissal or whatever it might be. Yeah, some director or something might have had some personality problem and so the employee is unfairly dismissed. And so the employee is now suing the company. And so the company might have to pay half a million pounds, half a million dollars, whatever it might be, to, for compensation. So at the year end, it's called a contingent liability. It may or may not happen. It may be good or bad. And if it's bad, the company ought to tell its shareholders that in time to come they might have to find this half a million dollars <clears throat> and therefore the dividend might go down because of this. That kind of thing. Any kind of legal decision pending. So that's what you need to read. It's all really re reading knowledge. A contingent asset, by the way, you don't have to provide for. Be careful. Contingent provisions you do provide. Okay, so that's a big one. This was in the pilot paper somewhere. Remember that? The specimen paper. You provide for these. <clears throat> so provide a note. <coughs> Whereas a contingent asset. Do not provide. Only note. Obviously, it depends on the, the the likelihood. It has to be very close to being, you know, likely certain probability has to be very high to make any provision. Whereas with a contingent asset, you only note it, and indeed, if it's if the chances are very small of it happening, they just ignore it. So you take a much stricter view of of liabilities than assets. Some homework reading I want to set to you. Little examples with answers explained. A couple of pages. 
And so we come to our last little exercise called Eden. Give that a quick read and I'll show you how this might be solved. This is your typical MCQ type question. So have a quick read of that, please. So included in revenue is an amount of three million relating to sales made under special promotion in the last month of the year. They sold with an accompanying voucher equal to the selling price. Five years after the sale, I see, these vouchers will be exchanged for goods of the customer's choosing. So I can come back to you and use this piece of paper that you gave me when I, when I first bought goods from you, and I can use that to claim some goods from you free. The profit margin on these goods is said to be 30% of the selling price. Therefore, the cost, I suppose, is 70%. And market research estimates that 50% of the vouchers will be redeemed. The present value at the end of year one at the time the vouchers will be exchanged can be taken as 60 cents. Okay, so that's like a present value factor of 0 0.6. So what provision is needed? See that? And show also the journal entry, etc. If you want to, basically you debit the PL and you credit your provision. But how do we arrive at the figure? That's what I want to show you finally. And there are one or two other examples I'd like you to follow through uh, in the rest of that chapter for homework, please. I'll just move on to Eden. It says there <clears throat> that the total figure is 3 million and 50% will be redeemed. So I'm going to multiply by 50%. I'll then multiply by 70% or 0.7 to eliminate the profit margin of 30%. Because I want to know what the cost is of half the uh, vouchers being redeemed. I'll then multiply by 0.6, the present value. And so the answer, of course, is 630. And the journal entry, uh, you might, the examiner might easily ask, ask you to choose between A, B, C, and D, which journal entry is correct. And the one that is correct is where you debit your PL, cost of sales, and you credit your provision, non-current liability. The reason why I've gone for a non-current, because obviously it's more than a year away. Okay. In fact, it's five years away. So even at the end of the year, of the current year, there's still four years to go. And so you multiply 3,000 by 0.5, by 0.7, and 0.6, and the answer is, of course, 630. Debit PNL goes to cost of sales, and credit provision, non-current liability, 630. Okay, and that's basically where our time comes to an end for today. The rest of the chapter you must do for homework, as I suggest, including the next bit there. Some other, those are quite important things. I've put in some MCQs as well from recent exams, gives you some exposure, always with answers supplied. The um, page 224 is where I show you the events after the reporting period. We came across that inventory item 500 reduced to 360 in the question called in the question called altered okay so that's something i would like you to read otherwise my only task is to take you back to the um, program for today and if you finish off that altered question by doing the sfp and pick up some of those published questions york and new and winger and so on and pick up some of the MCQs, you should be well prepared for this coming exam. Don't forget that the MCQs and objective test questions are 60%. So there are going to be 30 of these questions of two marks each. Some of them are going to be little clusters. Yes, they're going to be three clusters of little scenarios. And so you have to read the, the scenario quite carefully. Uh, it might be consolidation, it might be a published account, it could be a ratio stub exercise. And you'll have um, five little questions of two marks each, making up ten. So there are three lots of ten. That's thirty, plus obviously the thirty for the conventional MCQs uh, that cover the whole syllabus. 
and then apart from that you've got your two 20 markers. Okay, otherwise all the very best and thank you for your attention. When I see you tomorrow, I hope to take the next bit into account, the substance over form and financial instruments, etc. Thank you.